it's this ancient knowledge. Mm -hmm. um, in fact, I, I wrote a song, which I, I can't sing all of it because I haven't learned it yet. I've only just finished writing it. But when I was in the Cheops Pyramid the first time, I got this chant because it's quite hard work. You know, you're bent double, it's boiling hot, you've got sweat dripping down you. Sometimes it was pitch black because the lights had gone mm -hmm. and you don't really know where you're going. So I just had this, this chant that came through, Ra Mat Ka. It's just three words, and I didn't really know what it meant, so I was just going, Ra Mat Ka, Ra Mat Ka, and it kept me going. And I said to Muhammad afterwards, um, what does it mean? You know, does it mean anything? Uh, and I knew that Ra was the sun god, I knew that. But uh, Mat is the power of truth, and Ka is the soul. Mm -hmm. So it was like, Ra Mat Ka. So um, I wrote this song later, and, and the words are, what is it, I can't remember. I can't remember the words, sorry. Ancient body, ancient stones. But it was all about the ancient mystery, you know, the ancient mystery, the ancient knowledge that is still there because the native Indians say that stones are alive and they are the, the keepers of the secrets. They hold, it's like, you know, they hold all the knowledge because they've been there since time began. So my chant, my little song, the chorus is, Ramat ka, Ramat ka, let truth be my goal. Ramat ka, Ramat ka, fly free, eternal soul. So it's really this, this ancient knowledge, this ancient truth, this ancient mystery, connecting with that and deepening that experience. And also when you go in a group, because we're a group that's focused on this Merkaba meditation, which is based on sacred geometry, which I don't teach, Tom teaches that. But when we go in a group on this journey, and when we do the chanting and the meditation and the sound all together in these sacred places, the group also kind of really bonds together, you know, which is wonderful. And the other thing we did, which isn't to do with the the pyramids, but we went out on a glass bottom boat into the sea. Uh, and uh, so we're under the sea and, and you, to the coral reef, so you can see all these fish. And I got the group making sound and connecting with the fish and the ocean and the water. And I had my guitar. I was sitting there just singing to the fish, you know, through this glass, just singing. So it's really beautiful experience. And did the other members of the group feel the same way you did? Or yes, you? everybody had an amazing time. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah, really good. I think that's what's so nice is when you do a trip like this, because, because you do the sightseeing as well. You know, we can go to a papyrus mm -hmm. shop and we go to an alabaster shop and we have lunch on the Nile and all that kind of thing. So that's a bit of the touristy thing. But because we're able to get these sacred places privately, we also went out into the desert um, and did a meditation up on a hill there. And that was incredible to sit up on, on these stones, you know, and then making sound and then you open your eyes and there's the desert, you know. It's extraordinary feeling. And there was just one single tree uh, because you, you really feel the connection of everything on the planet. When we were in the desert there, I felt the connection with the Native American Indians, you know, up on their high places and up on their stones and hills. And that's what we really need to do, you know, to feel the oneness rather than the separation, which creates all the problems with the religions and the wars. Mm -hmm. And. Um Going back to Egypt, yeah. would you have any advice for people who'd like to experience it more spiritually? Like you mentioned, military. <laughs> <laughs> well, no, you do have to get permission for everything, and that, that sometimes takes quite a while. I mean, uh, Agnieszka in Warsaw, who organizes things, is very good uh, at the, getting the connections in Egypt. And we stayed in Luxor um, in the evening because we wanted to see the temple in the evening. But to do that, because we were based in Hurghada, we had to pay for a military escort to go back across the desert at night because it's still dangerous. They, they won't allow you to leave Luxor after six mm -hmm. o'clock at night unless you have got your military escort. So you have to be very careful about that. And also about the clothes you wear to understand that it's a different culture. And if you go around with your mini skirts, you know, and the things cut around here, you know, 
you will attract a lot of a lot of sometimes unwanted attention from the men. You have to honour their culture as well, I think, and understand that it is it is a different culture and a different way of being. Um, I was given one of those long, um, oh, I've forgotten what they're called. It's like a long kaftan, really beautiful in turquoise. Two Polish ladies gave it to me as a gift, and the Egyptians really loved it. When I went um, into the um, alabaster shop, you know, with this on, and the owner came up and he said, "Oh, you look so beautiful," you know, they really like it when you respect their tradition and their way and I think you should do that. We go there as Westerners but it is a, a different religion and a different way of life you know and we need to honour that as much as we ask them to honour our way of life. Did you feel this spirituality that you felt in the temples also in the people or are they quite different? Do you think um, it's divided? You know? mm, that was a difficult question uh, because I found it difficult when I first went to Hurghada because the hotel was run entirely by men and for four days I didn't see an Egyptian woman mm. because we were just based inside the big hotel complex and I thought, oh, you know, this is very strange. Um, but then when we went down to Cairo, you know, you see more, you, you see more people. I think it's, it's difficult. Obviously there is this deep spiritual tradition uh, and deep spirituality, but there's also the inequality you know, when you drive into Hurghada a certain way and you see there are people living in the graveyard, you know. Um, you see the children who are, are ragged and everyone is is begging, looking for bakshish, looking for money. It's, it's a hard, hard life really. And you know, you're driving along in your air-conditioned coach and you just see some some person just sitting on a stone by the side of the road, just just sitting there and you think, what are they doing there, you know? They're just sitting and they don't seem to have anything. So um, I think it's, in some ways, it's a hard life for them. But yes, there is a great, obviously a great spiritual mm -hmm. tradition. But this ancient tradition has been lost somehow. Is it felt in the people that, you know, they're just monuments for well, touristic Well, there is the one side of it, which is, that, you know, they're just touristic monuments, mm -hmm. yes. But then there are other people who are still on the same spiritual mm -hmm. path, you know. Um, there was, there's a lovely man that, whose shop we went to who's creating remedies and um, perfumes, and but very spiritual ones. Mm -hmm. And he created one which is called um, Healing of the Soul you know, which was absolutely gorgeous to smell. And then he'd created a whole range of chakra perfumes as well. So there are people who are working on, on the same level. And then, of course, there are those who are just you know, creating whatever they can to get the money from the tourists, but they have to survive. So you can't, you know, tourism is, is their way of life. Mm -hmm. And in the Cheops Pyramid, if I understand correctly, you sang for the first time in yeah. Egypt. Was this an internal sort of thing, or were you asked to sing? No, Tom. Tom was wonderful because uh, Tom De Winter, because you know he's leading the Merkaba meditation, but he kept asking me to sing all over the place, you know, and he just whispered in my ear, "Sing something, you know. Sing. Have you got a song for opening the heart? Have you got a song for the feminine energy?" I sang Ave Maria in the Queen's Chamber, and that was strange because it's a real mixture, you know, there's, it's the Queen's Chamber, it's Egyptian, but Maria is the Divine Feminine, mm -hmm. so we were connecting with the Divine Feminine in ourselves, going through the pyramid, you know, with the, the base chamber is the root, you know, connecting to the earth, and then we go up to the second chamber, that's the feminine, that's the right side of the brain, the top chamber is the masculine, the left mm -hmm. side of the brain, so we were really trying to, to balance ourselves through the pyramid energy um, and it was such an honor to be asked to sing you know I, I just thought well, I can't believe this and someone filmed some of it as well Tom asked me to sing a song when we were in the King's Pyramid of um, coming home into the heart and I just improvised I just improvised this whole song everyone was sitting on the floor and lying on the floor and I was just singing and uh, I couldn't really believe it that my voice was echoing around the Cheops Pyramid you know it was Really extraordinary. Sphinx, we were standing by the Sphinx and it was twilight. 
and you know it's that part of Cairo where, where the desert begins so there's a lot of desert and there are the hills and the stars and a crescent moon and as I looked at the hills it was like something out of a Hollywood film these two camels <laughs> were going being rib, driven ridden across the hills and you saw the silhouette of the camel heads and the riders mm. against the night sky and I thought this is just amazing what a picture you know the pyramid the sphinx the, the stars the moon and two camel heads mm -hmm. really wonderful is the sun different or um being um you know amun ra was the son of god yes is there something felt differently towards the sun in Egypt, or is it just... Well, the ancient, the ancient religion was that the sun was God. Mm -hmm. You know, Amun-Ra was mm -hmm. the sun god. And in fact, um, I had had an experience when I was um, doing, uh, actually receiving some therapy in England, because therapists need therapy as well, you know. Some years ago, she'd said to me, the therapist suddenly said, go back to the time, go back to a life where you had, where you really had your power. And I, I went back uh, and I was a, a, a young girl called Rana uh, and I had this power to make the rain fall. <laughs> it sounds extraordinary, doesn't it? But my parents knew that and they, they gave me this name Rana and I suddenly remembered it this time in Egypt and I said to Mohammed, is there an Egyptian name, Rana? And he said, oh yes, yes, my, my sister's child is called it or something, Rana. What does it mean? He said, well, Ra is the sun god, Rana means you are part of God. You know, so that was extraordinary for me that I had intuited this name that actually existed. So yes, Rana in the ancient times was God. You know, God wasn't something separate. Ra, the sun was God because you know, without the sun and the heat and the warmth of the sun, you can't live without the, the, everything growing. And, mm -hmm. yeah. Is it different the sun in the desert? The whole picture. <laughs> I don't know. It's the, hot. I mean, the um, the feeling of it all with the pyramids and if you put yourself back in, in um, the area of the temples. Is yeah. it somehow connected to the sun? Can well, I think, I think you really feel the power of the sun. Mm -hmm. You know, I come from England where we're lucky if we get mm -hmm. a sunny summer, mm -hmm. but it's, it's, uh, you know, it's a gentle sun. Mm -hmm. I can understand why they feel that the sun is God mm -hmm. or they mm -hmm. felt that the sun was God in Egypt because that sun can kill, you know, it's, it's relentless. Uh, even walking up through the Valley of the Kings, you know, it was about 38 degrees the first time we were there. We were there in May. It was very, very hot. And you can feel how, you know, if you're out in that for a whole day, my feet were beginning to swell, you know, and you're thinking, water, water. It's relentless. Mm -hmm. So it's amazing, but, you know, it's dangerous, that sun, so... Ruthless. Ruthless, mm -hmm. yes, absolutely ruthless, yeah. We had some fun. We had these four-wheel drive bikes, you know, and we were going around the desert on them just for some fun. But they made us put these, um, we, they tied all our scarves in this beautiful way. The, the men did it, you know, they knew exactly how to tie it. You twist this here, you twist this there, and then suddenly, you know, we all had these veils on uh, because of the sand, because you couldn't breathe it in. So, And it was lovely, actually, because it's, you know, it's quite cool. And I found when it was very hot that wearing the long, kaftan type dress actually helps because it shields you from the sun whereas you think you'll be hotter mm -hmm. it's actually cooling <laughs> well thank you very much thank you nice to talk to you thank you Thank you.